Thank you, Farah, for that uh, charming, <laughs> charming introduction. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. It's great to see everybody here, uh, and um, it's, 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 uh, it's a great pleasure to, to be giving this talk. Uh, so, in preparing, I reflected on whether I have a strategy or a philosophy of sustainable design. And the expression, keep it simple, stupid, somehow came to mind. But it doesn't really do it for me. I really don't like the idea that uh, particularly design would be, would be stupid. So, uh, kind of move that on a little bit. How about keep it uh, simple and sustainable? That's just much better for me. So, I've been at Arup for nearly 25 years and worked on many different projects with a wonderfully diverse range of people. And I think I've actually stayed because of our collective ambition to shape a better world. So for the next 20 minutes, I'm going to talk about the idea of better building design, keeping it simple and sustainable. I'd like to share with you my inspiration to design buildings that are better and simpler than we've done before, that are cheaper and easier to build and use, more controllable and efficient to operate, for me, this is a process of incremental innovation rather than great step changes. So, Farah is always keen that we avoid vague concepts in these talks. And there's a risk that the word sustainability is a little too vague. But for me, I'm happy enough with the idea of the triple bottom line understanding that helps us to focus on people and planet and a reasonable prosperity, in the words of Ovarup. So, as a building designer, I'm going to address the specific field of sustainable building technologies and share some success stories about a simple design, which I hope will encourage us all. A little serious bit, really, but we, we are increasingly convinced about the reality of climate change and somehow held back by our lack of confidence to really tackle the issue. Maybe sometimes genuine intent to address the challenge. And this, again, I think comes out of our lack of confidence. For me, the great thing about simple design is that it can reduce our impact on the world and it can save our money as well. So many aspects of the sustainability agenda are simply common sense. They're easier and cheaper to do, but we need to break through the barriers for not doing them. So uh, it's common enough to precede these talks with some words of wisdom or, uh, on the particular theme, ideally from our founder Ovarup or another great thinker from the past. I've chosen a great thinker and artist from the 20th century to help illustrate the idea. <laughs> so I think the singer-songwriter Prince was trying to use his song Kiss to share his philosophy of life. Maybe he didn't realise that it applies so directly to sustainable building design. <laughs> Stay with me. So to explain, these are the lyrics of the song. I don't know whether I'm going to get away with the sing-along this early in the morning. Kind of warm up for the Christmas party. I don't know. How, how, how are we feeling? Don't sing. <laughs> so I've been told not to sing. I can do it later after over coffee. You don't have to be rich to be my girl. You don't have to be cool to rule my world. Ain't no particular sign I'm more compatible with. I want your extra time and your kiss. So, as they say, let's uh, unpack this a little bit. Following Prince's lead, is sustainable design all about being rich or being cool? Is it about compatibility and do we need any extra time to get it right? To explore these themes, I'm going to tell some stories about keeping design simple and sustainable. Starting with rich. At Sheffield University, Jessup West Building is a very, very pared back building. This is a great example of holistic design thinking. It has the UK's first acoustically attenuated facade system designed to allow natural ventilation without the need, uh, uh, despite all the noisy roads outside. As well as having no fan-assisted mechanical ventilation system, it has no raised floors or any suspended ceilings. It's a super simple building where money was saved on non-essential items and spent on the, on the great looking facade that also allows natural ventilation and low carbon operation. Another example for you. 40 Chancery Lane is a new office building by Derwent London with Bennett Associates Architects. And it demonstrates a new air conditioning solution for London. 
The challenge was to provide a high quality office environment, departing from traditional metal ceilings, and fit this into a very constrained story height. So we've implemented a chilled plasterboard uh, ceiling solution, which avoids all moving parts, fans or filters that a typical fan core solution would require. The ceiling void depth is 125 millimeters. Fresh air is introduced through the raised floor. And the space, as you can see, has great clean lines, plain white ceiling and suspended lighting. So it's not quite as minimal as the Jessup West project, but as well as being very energy efficient, it's efficient on height, allowing the building to fit into the tight planning envelope. The approach can save 10 to 15% on a story height, and so this saves a lot of money and the embodied carbon of construction. So for a final example of cost-effective design, Trust Floor is a new product that, dem that demonstrates reduced cost simple design. It's a neat structural product that combines ceiling, structure, and services distribution in one go. It's a prefabricated solution that uses material efficiently, reduces waste, is quick to build, and significantly reduces building heights. The addition of the raised floor on top of the prefabricated system is all that's required to complete the floor sandwich. And this is the comparison with a typical fan, fan core solution. Significant, rate, uh, sk significant saving in story height. So cool. Does, uh, does green architecture have to look a certain way? Are we talking about hair shirt projects or modern architecture? The Siemens Crystal is unashamedly modern. It's a statement of intent from Siemens that the future is high tech. An all electric building, it looks forward to the future when future decarbonisation of the electricity supply. And it was a really great project to work on. The Crystal is actually undoubtedly a complex building with many different systems and it relies on all of them to achieve its exemplary uh, uh, credentials. It could be said to be the greenest building in the world. Unique in achieving the highest possible ratings, BREM Outstanding and LEED Platinum. I'll leave that to you to decide. But it's not a simple building. It has a wide array of technologies that allow these high, high scores to be achieved. But however, underneath, the essence of the design is simple. For me, the best part of the design is that the building is fully daylit. Its facade obviously needed to provide control of solar gains to minimise cooling requirements, but at the same time, we couldn't block out the valuable daylight. Solar thermal and photovoltaics are our usual renewable energy, but surely the most basic renewable energy is daylight. Up to a quarter of the carbon footprint of a commercial office building can be attributed to the artificial lighting. So to make big energy savings, we carefully varied the glazed areas and introduced roof lights to maintain adequate levels of daylight throughout the space. So in my experience uh, of all, all the projects I've worked on, not a single one has ever achieved the BREAM daylight credits. It's proved to be too hard. But on this project, I think it's pretty unusual because we, we achieved the full daylight credits for the crystal. We've had great feedback from the people who are working there. They really do enjoy the natural light. For me, one of the reasons it's an impressive building is that the client brief meant that there was nowhere to hide. To get the highest scores, we had to think about all the things we could do to improve its performance. It's a particular example of a showcase building, but all of the technologies and design can be implemented on much more usual buildings. We've learned how to use them all together on a more ambitious building, but they can all individually be used on more conventional projects. Final example. Green roofs are my next example of green enhancement at low cost and for good return on investment. At Triton Square, for example, we've implemented low-cost biodiverse roof terraces. This is a trend on recent projects um, where our clients are taking the opportunity to increase rents in, in this way while responding to the green agenda. The occupants can look out across greenery and so are happier and more productive. Further benefits are stormwater attenuation, trapping of dust and the biodiversity of the insects and birds that the roof attracts. Let's talk about compatibility. Required in any relationship, including how a design team and client work together. We need to make sure that we understand our clients and their drivers and their aims for a particular project. If these aren't expressed, it's important to explore them and get them stated clearly. 
We should then aim to, they should explore the aims and where possible test them, explaining how a client can get a better outcome. For example, we can help the client avoid a development brief that's too demanding and introduces complexity. Are the small power and lighting loads too high? And so are the cooling demands too high? Starting with a need for a building that's not too demanding in the first place allows the design team to design out complexity and come up with a simpler building. Classically, this can mean fewer building services systems and cost. We can show the client what they could achieve, cheaper, simpler, more attractive, or more flexible. In our resource-constrained world, why use more when you can use less? Why introduce complexity when it could be simpler? Often our clients don't want a cool-looking green flagship building and certainly don't want to spend lots of extra money on sustainability add-ons. On a current commercial project, we're using two simple and very cost-effective compatible technologies. So we're working on the, the refurbishment of, a, of an office in King's Cross to turn it into a hotel. But we have a big problem because the local area is at risk from flooding and has li limited sewer capacity. A possible solution would be to collect stormwater in huge tanks in the basement and then pump it out every time it rains. But this, of course, is expensive, wasteful of space and uses energy every single time it rains. A much more elegant and cheaper solution is to use attenuating rainwater outlets on the roof. They hold back the water while it's raining and it drains away slowly after the storm. It's a relatively new solution which we've implemented on a number of recent projects. So now we have the confidence to use blue roofs on all appropriate projects. And it's a great example for me of finding a cheap and simple solution for a really expensive problem. For another example, how about a technology that can halve your heat demand for showering and has no moving parts or difficult maintenance. The technology exists and is in extensive use in Canada and Holland, amongst other places, and I've put it in in my, uh, my second bathroom as well, just to give it a try. It's a simple heat exchange arrangement that passively transfers heat from the shower water, the, the waste shower water, back into the, the fresh shower water. It's maintenance free, and in a hotel context it's perfect. It can save 40 to 50% of the showering energy use. This reduces the boiler capacity by 250 kilowatts, reduces the hot water tanks by 30%, and saves about 30 square meters of plant space in the basement. The payback is just a few years, plus it makes a valuable contribution to improving the energy performance rating of the building as well. So this is an obvious technology for all our residential and hotel projects. Zooming out to the UK context, as we ch tackle the challenge of reducing our carbon emissions in our buildings, we find that low carbon or renewable heat is very difficult to produce. Just think how we could reduce the national electricity demand if this technology were w really widely implemented across the country. So the idea of extra time leads me to the design process. And to use a football analogy, it's not simply about extra time. It's about getting it right all the way from the kickoff. Very nice long shorts like that. Smart thinking is needed from the start. I think as an industry, we have a collective tendency to overcomplicate. Complex technical solutions are available to us, and sometimes we just revert to them before we get the basics right. For me, it's important that a design can be clearly communicated, that the reasons for the solutions are clear. And when I talk about the design, this can apply to the diagram for the whole building, or a, simple, a system, or even down to a component. Is the purpose clear? and can the design be simplified? Now, of course, we could overemphasize simplicity, but in the face of ever-increasing complexity and fragmentation in our industry, I believe it's worth holding on to as a guiding principle. The approach applies to the architectural principles. Uh, a simple design will benefit a project. It makes it easier for all to understand from the design team on through the contractors to the operators and the occupants. If the principles of a building are simple, I believe the handover can be more meaningful with the FM team understanding the building better. It won't be just a case of, well, here are the operation and maintenance manuals, good luck. The approach applies to the 
architectural principles of organisation of a building and the building services. And in some buildings, the clarity is there for all to see. So I, did, I had the great pleasure to work on the Leadenhall Tower for a number of years. And it's a great example of a simply planned building with a very clear diagram. Uh, with Roger Stoke Harper Partners, we developed the concept of servant and served spaces. The north core of the building provides all the building services, the toilets and the lifts, which you can dramat so dramatically see on the facade. The front south facing part of the building is the occupied space with great views across the city of London. This clarity continues in the building services and even the services coordination principles that we established right at the beginning are unchanged in a final fit out. So this talk, of course, wouldn't be complete without a mention of BIM. Time is well spent early on to illustrate the coordination principles and in developing a clear diagram. But we need to be careful about diving in too early into 3D coordination. BIM can be a great tool, but it's not a means to achieve spaghetti coordination of a building that doesn't have a clear plan. I'm an advocate of spending enough time and money on early design thinking on the basis that the clarity it brings reduces uncertainty and risk, streamlines the procurement and construction process, and so reduces the final cost of a product. This diagram is a neat illustration of, the ability, of how the ability to influence the outcome of a project diminishes as time moves on and how the cost of change increases through the program of the project. So to sum up, we should think through what we're doing and be ambitious about the outcomes. To quote another 20th century guru, he put it very bluntly, do or do not, there is no try. Pretty uncompromising. Somehow I like the directness of that. With our clients, we're on a journey of exploring exactly how ambitious they want to be on their projects. The process is honest about the challenge and the problems and the reasons for why things might go wrong. We know that we'll set our sights higher than we might achieve, but by the same token, if we don't aim any higher than last time, we won't shape a better world at all. When I joined Arup, a senior director described engineering as 90% perspiration and 10% inspiration. Well, possibly slightly depressing, but I found this to be very true. Certainly the inspiration is the important part. We, then we, we need to get, get on and do the job. Are we standing around waiting for this inspiration? A paradigm shift or a step change? What I want to advocate is that we do everything we can across a project that's within our power to make this one better than the last, a process of incremental innovation. So then maybe this is my recipe for a simple green so building, may. a specification that leads to low energy use, floor plate and facade that balance daylight and overheating, a lean structure, a blue roof to attenuate rainwater combined with a green roof to enrich our environment. The point is, we can build like this. We need to pay attention to doing simple things, from specification through to operation. So let's do what we can, make progress, and not look for excuses. I hope these project examples have inspired you to simpler, more sustainable design. So I will finish with a quote from our founder, Ove Arup, with a bit of Christmas sparkle. We must therefore strive for quality in what we do, and never be satisfied with second rate. And a closing reflection from Leonardo da Vinci, who put it in a very sophisticated way, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Keep it simple, sustainable. Thank you. So now I think this is where I take questions. Um, you really eloquently put it about the getting it right from the beginning. Who do you think should write and own the brief? So I find it slightly disappointing when our clients say, oh, you know, to the design team, right, you guys knock up the brief. I think you know what we want. And, uh, and, and, you, and, and then we do and we write it and then it sort of sits there and it's not really a very tested or tried and tested document. So I, I think um, for me, it's, it, even the sense that you kind of get a mission statement from your clients saying he, he doesn't want to write down all the the detail or the, the stuff about, you know, the sound rating of the walls or whatever it might be. But he, 
it's important that the client sets the scene and, and, and starts the sets the, the level of ambition or the, or the level of delivery that, that, that's required for a project. Then I think it's okay that the team will then come in and fill that out and turn it into what is a properly uh, filled out technical brief. That was uh, interesting, quite uh, amazing because of the relation between simplicity and uh, uh, sustainability. Simplicity and sustainability actually it's a relation which not always uh, to match and depends on the environment, such as uh, places where I work, uh, China, uh, since many years, sustainability and simplicity are two different words uh, most of the time. But I agree that keep it simple, sustainable is the right, the right way. I thought it was excellent. Um, it's really good to see sustainability seen as something which isn't a bolt-on, that's, to me, that I find it so challenging that uh, it always seems to be the last ditch kind of thought, so it's just, oh hang on, have we, have we tackled sustainability yet? Well, let's quick, quickly do, do a bit of that. So, so it's good to have that early engagement and, um, and what Jonathan was talking about today was, was just exactly the way we need to go. Well, the question of, of industry uptake in, in, this, in, in this area, I think um, I think we need to get some some runs on the board. We need to see some projects that really demonstrate some good results, such as the projects Jonathan just showed us. They're a great example. So the more the more that can be talked out and, and demonstrated and publicised, the more likely other consultants will take on board these kind of principles. And uh, you know, consultants such as Arup are, are going to be ideally placed to to deliver. And it's time the other consultants got on board as well. I think Arup's a fantastic in doing these talks because you've always had a reputation for thinking about the future and doing research. So to, to do the talk, to explain the message, very important. And the feedback at the end of those is just, just as important as, as that. In terms of regulations, I think that we go too far and we lose the principles. So it's really nice that Jonathan was talking about keeping it simple, um, keeping the principles, thinking about principles, and that's what I've always admired Arab for.